Hello, welcome to the Sunday Science Q&A of the Shambles Stay at Home Festival. Uh, a few things before we actually get started. We've had loads of uh, very interesting questions uh, about things that are in the deep sea. Not too many that are too far out in space because that is not really the area of expertise of our panel today, but that will be on Thursday when we have Brian Cox at 10 a.m. Uh, we're going to do one of our Shambles College shows there, uh, which is next week. Basically, what we're having is we thought, well, the schools have gone back. So we are after Monday when we've got Mark Gatiss on. Uh, that's the end of the holiday. Mark Gatiss is your final holiday treat. Then on Tuesday, we've got uh, classicist Natalie Haynes. Uh, so any questions that you've got uh, about the classical world, Greek, Roman, etc. And also David McColman's going to be talking uh, about art and possibly Heracles. And then Wednesday, we've got A.L. Kennedy doing the English literature course for us. Thursday, uh, Brian Cox, and I think we've got someone from CERN as well. And then Friday, Ian Rankin's doing pop music and criminal acts. So that pretty much covers the whole of the agenda, I think. And uh, I'll mention as well, we have a tip jar at the bottom of the page and the tip jar at the bottom of the page is we're creating resource hopefully for some of the performers who've kind of been hit very hard by the end of all their work and some of them it's then also been quite hard for them to work out how to get any kind of money uh so uh we're making a fund for them and also we're using some of that fund to give money to some of the art centers that are struggling some art centers of course have already gone under so we're trying to keep them going so i think last week we gave to uh, the rondo in bath and the old fire station in oxford and little angel puppet theater in uh, islington and next week if we make enough money we will travel a little bit further north with those donations so we'll keep moving around and also we've got 1201 alarm at some point during the show if you know steve thompson you may well have seen him at some of the live shows we've done he is uh, our go-to laser harpist uh, but he's also a multi-instrumentalist and he's going to be playing some stuff so that's pretty much it i think um yeah after uh, yep yeah, that'll do fine um oh also the family science shows i'll just quickly mention those uh go and check out we've done a load of family science shows and uh, they've got lots of activities and helen church is one of our guests uh, is on them and i know that people were tweeting yesterday and putting up on facebook some of the experiments they've done and they were all successful and they have not ruined their upholstery as yet so well done helen chersky this is our panel for today by the way our panel today and also sophie scott from ucl head of neuroscience there and also in the world of the mind uh we have professor richard wiseman in fact it's professor professor doctor is that right am i right in doing that helen you're yeah. you're not official you should be a professor. a professor no <laughs> it's an absolute nonsense that you're not a professor i always introduce you as in fact it's professor 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 because we're in charge of the world now during this period of isolation <laughs> let us live out these fantasies i'll tell my head of department immediately <laughs> I, I'm happy to send them an email if that will help. I am sometimes on Radio Four. I imagine that carries some weight with it. Um, so we're gonna we're gonna start off with the show and tell. Thank you very much for everyone who sent questions. But let's find out what our guests have. Let's start with uh, Sophie. Um, you have a show and tell for us. So what I brought along, I don't know if you can see this right in front of me there. That is a little um, prehistoric stone tool that I found on a beach in Pembrokeshire. And I don't know if it's made by a Neanderthal or a modern human, but um, it's thousands and thousands and thousands of years old. And I find it kind of extraordinary to think about human brains and just sort of like, well, for example, the fact that as soon as modern humans appeared, they started changing the world around them. And their brains are exactly or were exactly exactly the same as ours. No evolution whatsoever in brains since modern humans appeared. Quite extraordinary. Also, it helps me remember that I once went to a beach. See, now, how can we know if we're ever allowed again to go onto the beaches of Pembrokeshire? How can we know that we've not just found a stone, that it was definitely a tool? What are the signs to show that I'm not just waving a pebble around? Well, I thought it was a pebble when I picked it up because um, I, I like pebbles. But um, if you look, you can sort of see it's been shaped to a blade at the front and it just comes down to a little point that curls over. So and it completely fits my hand. So it's made for somebody right handed and it's a, just a tiny little cutting tool. It's not, uh, you know, you probably wouldn't set out about to hunt a mammoth with this, but it's probably used for skinning or something. And you know, it's been knocked around by the sea, but you can see how it's been shaped and it's shaped exactly so it can be held. That's what I find fascinating about that as well. And I always find it fascinating when in documentaries, people go to these kind of these incredible, incredible areas, expanses where they are all, you know, the flints are all things that have been fashioned into tools. But the strange thing about, and I don't know if there's any neuroscience perspective on this, but the fact that human beings the point or our ancestors they go let's make a tool 
and then they make one and that's it they're happy with it we made that that tool's fine so why did we why do we take in, in terms of we found and i know there are some tools didn't survive i realize some were wood etc but overall it does seem incredible that we have a long period of real we are you know using tools but we don't in any way diversify and then there is this sudden moment <laughs> you get these so you're absolutely right so other hominids made things um the thing that seems to change when you get to modern humans is they're not just tools that are useful and fit the human body. So we're making stuff with our hands that can be used by, with our hands. The, the, that modern humans carry on doing that, but they add in sort of representational stuff on top. So you make a comb, but it also looks like a horse. You make jewellery, you make art, you start making things that can have multiple possible roles and functions. And that seems to be one of the things that is, that, 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 how, the, how, the, how the thing is being, being represented a stone a knife could be more than a knife it could have ceremonial meaning it could be beautiful that seems to be the thing that starts to come in with modern humans there's another kind of layer of understanding there's a depth of 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 how you're thinking about the information and the possible links between things that seems to be behind well arguably behind the kind of explosion of stuff that you start finding you start finding things painted on walls things that have no immediate purpose but you can look at them and tell stories about them engage with them so when was the last time that we would say there was a, a notable change in the volume of uh, the, 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 the hominid brain? Um, well, probably it's difficult to say because Neanderthal brains are not that different in terms of scale from brains, modern human brains. Um, if anything, what seems to change from that point on is our bodies get smaller our brains stay the same size and everything else gets smaller because we don't need huge great big bodies to be powerful if we've got big brains and we can co-ordinate with each other to become amazing hunters that way and we're building tools that can help us so it's like we could kind of scale down everything else once we've got a huge thing here brilliant that's that's fantastic this is fantastic. Uh, this is now uh, now we're going to go to uh, richard wiseman uh richard what is your show and tell for this morning uh my show and tell my show and tell yeah. Is uh, it's a plastic is a plastic bird which looks a little bit like that. In fact, it looks exactly like that. <laughs> and um, and a sharpie which looks exactly like that. I'll hold it this way up, <clears throat> ever the pro, so the uh, uh, the black end doesn't uh, uh, vanish. And you put the bird here, and if you concentrate, in fact, everybody needs to concentrate on it, and you release it, and the bird balances on the pen and spins around which is a brilliant example of the power of thought, because when you don't concentrate on it, uh, it falls off the pen. So um, there we go. Remarkable. Now, obviously, you as much money as Yuri Geller with your balancing bird. Uh, you've, I, I, I know you've been, you take a balancing bird into a government. You say, I'll be able to help you find oil with my balancing bird. Um, but that, that, that is a lovely trick because with a little bit more, you know, as you now uh, again, hang on a minute. I don't know if everyone was concentrate. Oh, no, no. I wasn't certain I'm everyone. Was. In Swindon, not concentrating, which is why it didn't go round quite so quickly. But now we picked up. But on now we picked up on them. Uh, you, it uh, it, it uh, moves round a little bit faster. So yeah, it's remarkable. And uh, it's so not real, but it's plastic. <laughs> It's, a, it's the kind of thing that a scientist can pick up on that a lot of us novices we have no idea but this That's is because i love watching st a lot of the stuff that i've seen you do is using uh conjuring techniques and using what you discovered about human psychology to to some extent debunk some of the you know that it, it only takes a little bit of uh, extra obfuscation and uh, someone to eventually goes i have the power of the mind and you just keep rubbing the watch and all of that kind of thing so that is how are we taken in by those things as, as you monitor how many different you know when, when yuri geller was of course the, the famous thing with when james randy would go around and he would show how a, a, a spoon was bent then very often people would go well it's the power he's got magic powers as well it's not that he it's a trick he's got magic got magic powers um, there's a few things going on. I mean, there's obviously a, a kind of want to believe in, in that stuff. The world is a bit more yeah. fun if you think people have got psychic ability and there's magical um, stuff out there. I, I think a big part of it, though, is we're kind of built for cause and effect. And, and so when two things, when this thing happens, and then this thing happens, you think, well, that caused that. So if you say, I concentrate on this and then something happens, we just link those two in our minds, even though there's, there's no uh, actual reality there. 
which is how the whole of magic works. You know, magicians oh, yeah. don't just come on and do something. They'll do is put a coin in their hand and then blow, and that'll make it disappear. And, and in our minds, we're, we're linking those two things. That, that's what we do. It's why we're successful most of the time. But magic and some fake psychic stuff trip us up. That's powerlessness. Even, you know, I've watched some of the tricks that you've done many, many times. And even though my conscious brain is going, watch that this time. Watch, stop looking at the wrong bit, which he's distracting you from. At the point of you doing it, my I, I look in the wrong part. It's very, very hard not to follow the more instinctive kind of uh, subconscious or unconscious, whatever it might be. As you know, and then the, my petty little frontal lobes are, are left at sea. Yeah, no, it's, it is. Uh, I'm actually, I wasn't intending to do this to do this, but um, I just pick up an object. This is a dinosaur, um, but it could be any. I don't know what sort of dinosaur it is, except it's a plastic one. Um, but if, if you if you want to make that disappear, and you've seen me do this lots of times um, here, and it goes. Now it, it's really weird to do that the first time you learn it because you are looking at the hand that doesn't hold the dinosaur, and and it's such a but, it, but you are right, you know, it's such a compelling thing to to so yeah, they, they, all these magic tricks they, they kind of trip us up, but in a sense they show how brilliant we are because we weren't making those assumptions or those shortcuts. We, we just wouldn't be able to operate in the world. If you see a chair, you don't think, I wonder if it's got a missing back leg. You just assume it's got four legs. <laughs> Otherwise, you'd be checking out every chair. So, so magic <laughs> kind of weaves its way around, but in a sense, it's a celebration of the fact that we are actually really good at perceiving and thinking. Hell Except is. me, actually. I was going to mention, my, I, I, I was trying to come up with something to do, like an online course. And uh, I, I didn't want to learn a language. I'm terrible at that sort of thing. So my online course, I'm learning how to make pop-up books. And I was looking at uh, Sophie's the stone tool there, and that's far more sophisticated and effective than any pop-up book I've managed to make so far. It's a lot harder than you might imagine. That's all I'm saying. Do you generally find that the pop-up tower is still hanging out some of the main body of the book? Because that seems to be, you finish it all and you go, and then I just fold it, and whoa, that's way too much out of the book. <laughs> it's really hard. It's really, I'm following it, like, bit by bit. I'm pretty good with my hands, and I go like this, like this, and the whole thing just falls apart. And on the video, it's absolutely fine. It's, um, so anyway, so I'm learning, I've, got, I've got two of them over there. If we get any quiet time during the show, I'm prepared to bring them out and show you how bad I am at making pop up. <laughs> oh, I'm going to make some quiet time just because that's so <laughs> great. Um, Helen, what magic trick are you going to do for us? Uh, well, I'm, I'm feeling very disappointed. I don't have a magic trick that follows on quite nicely from what Sophie showed us, actually, which is this. And inside it here, um, so this is a knife. And the exciting thing about this knife for me is that I made it, or at least I made this bit. Somebody else did that bit. But on a, you know, there are people who now look at Viking technology, can recreate Viking Forge. And so I made this on a Viking Forge. And the fascinating thing about making blades like this, so this is steel. So I was making a program, we were talking about temperature. And um, in fact, I think it's being repeated at the moment. And, and the interesting thing about steel is that to really make it work, you need to be quite sophisticated. You need to heat it up and cool it down and hammer it. And you need to do all those things in the right order. And when you've done all of that, you get something like a knife which is a really powerful like it's a really important tool but actually the, the the interesting thing about this process is the sophistication of it so to go along with the thing that sophie was saying about her stone it's not just that you need a stone that's approximately the right size and shape and all those kind of things it's that the process of making it has a huge amount of subtlety and so um I and, and I and and you know the, the metallurgy you know, obviously the a thousand years ago someone making something like this would have had no idea that atoms existed they wouldn't have understood the difference between steel and iron and levels of carbon and why it is you might dunk it in water all of that stuff and yet they put the effort in and got it right and I find this is not impressive because I made it in fact there's a knit there's a little bit uh, somebody else put the handle on and polished it and they couldn't polish away the bit where I chipped the wrong bit. Um, so it's not, you know, it's not the most useful knife. But um, just the sophistication of the process is amazing. And I love it for that, that we forget that these objects, so many stages go into how, it's not just the person making it then, it's all the people who went before them that worked out that if you did this and not this, um, it, you know, you get something better. And obviously it reminds us that the Vikings were brilliant crafts people. They weren't just pillaging raping you know invading people and wandering around in daft hats which were an invention they were very you know sophisticated skilled crafts people who traded and who made tools and and you know I, so i like this so this is my show and tell 
That's why I always think whenever I go to a craft fair, I know there's a very different side, very different to, a side to a lot of those people when they're not using their yarn. Um, the uh, Actually, could you mention that? I know we had a question from a young man called Arlo. Uh, who that It's just because the last time I saw him down in Eastbourne, he kept showing off his knife while his mother said, put it away. But it's a brilliant hunting knife, Mum. Anyway, so he asked a question, which was, how did they make the first ruler straight? Now, there's the uh, so Arlo is nine years old, wanted to know. He, 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 his, his mum said he was looking at his ruler and he went, Mum, but how do they make the first one straight? I would guess gravity something to do with it. Just if you have a thread and you hold it, use it like a plumb line, you, you know, it will it will hold unless it's really knotted, nasty thread. You will get a straight line. Um, and there's a few ways you think you can also compare different straight things next to each other but it's a really interesting question because it's it's like the question of length you've got who does it first once you've got one you can manage so so i suspect it it had a lot to do with gravity but it's not a trivial task um and again it's one of these things once someone's done it everyone else can compare theirs against it but someone had to do it first all right so that's uh that question number one question number two i'm going to throw this at you richard this is from um alison cleary she would like to know no. why does, why does it seem that often people at crosswalks scurry to get across before the light changes but if they don't make it all the way when the light then changes they don't scurry faster for the last bit but rather slow down they've already lost so why bother or is there something else going on so this is the first question we've had in the four weeks about uh four weeks pedestrian, about, uh, pedestrian etiquette but um <laughs> psychologically what do we know about this? Um, so I'm trying to work out what the phenomena is here. So just go. go what, what's the what's what's the phenomena? So I think what what Alison's observed, and it might be specific to her crosswalk, is so. Go, uh, oh, it's already turned green. The, the little man's turned green. Uh, I better run there. Run, 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 and then it just starts flashing, and then it changes. And once you no longer have the certainty of the green human there flashing, uh, then you just uh, I've got, and you just walk slowly across the road. I I. I I've never seen that. Um, so I've, I've seen people walk a lot quicker once it starts to flash, which would be the rational thing to do. Uh, you would have thought the people that move slowly once it starts to flash would be removed from the gene pool fairly <laughs> rapidly. Um, so maybe what she's seeing are people that won't be around very long. So she's seeing a very, very rare uh, phenomenon. Um, I guess the other thing from a social science perspective would be ownership, because once you're halfway across the road, maybe you think, well, this is my stretch of road now. I, I own this stretch of road. And so it's OK for me to go a little bit more slowly. Um, but I think I'll, I'll be nipping out later on to do a, a full study uh, on that. And I can feed back the, uh, the results. Excellent. This is uh, uh, this one's for you, Sophie. This so is Martha from... says, um, I've heard that fMRIs are not ultimately that specific in understanding our brain. What is the next technological leap that we need to be able to understand the structure? Um, oh, well, you, you don't know. But for, so the problem with fMRI is that it's great and it's brilliant, but what you're measuring is blood flow. And blood flow changes in your brain. When your brain does a bit of work, a bit more blood is sent there immediately, partly to take along oxygen and nutrients, partly to take away carbon dioxide um, and heat, cool things down. So you, it's a correlate that we're measuring. And actually, particularly um, you know, uh, with some of the sort of earlier ma magnets, what you were actually seeing was literally blood vessels. You were scanning, and then you could sort of see it looks like a draining vein. So it's always something slightly at a an, at a distance. Um, the other techniques, so blood flow has been good for kind of giving us general maps of the brain, but there's also been sort of electrical techniques. electrical techniques. So in humans, that's been things like EEG or MEG. And there has recently been a big step forward in MEG. So ma that's magnetic... Um, encephalography and basically use these super cooled conductors to pick up disturbances in the magnetic field of the earth caused by the brain activity <laughs> inside it's pretty crazy stuff um and that's always sort of like at the surface so that's pretty limited and it's, it's good you can only sort of see the top of the brain and there's been a big step forward um basically in how you can apply the conductors that started at Queen Square quite recently by a UCL colleague um, that seems to be likely to take that forward a step and that will give us the precision of being able to know where we are in the brain but also the speed of measuring electrical discharges now because the gold standard is always going to be actually measuring signals from actual brain cells and that's still some distance ahead of us because with humans that that's kind of a level of invasive science that we we just can't normally do 
Thank you. And this uh, this one's uh, for you, Helen. This, uh, an interesting kind of domesticity thing from Steve. Uh, this is for physics around the house. When I clean the remnants of jam out of a jar, I part fill it, put the lid on and give it a good shake to percussively loosen the jam. Two thirds full seems the ideal. But what does the optimum level depend on? So this is about jam clearance Ooh. in a jar. <laughs> <laughs> this is a critical problem for all those people stuck at home looking at mostly empty jam jars. Um, so the game here is that water is very dense. And if you uh, shake a jar that is half full of water, the water that was on one side thumps into the other side. And the problem is if you do it with a full jar, there's already some water in the way. So you can't get up enough speed and you can't get enough shear forces. to. You need some space so that the water kind of generates something different. So if you have a completely full jar, it doesn't do anything because it's all water. So the water, it's like one of those puzzles where you had little squares back in the, you know, years ago and you used to have to move one square to put the other square in that place. So you can't move it out of the way. So, so the critical things for this problem, I think what you want are, first of all, that to get jam off the side, what you really want is not impact. What you want is a shear force. So you're probably going to be better off if you can swirl the water around, but you want to stop and start that swirling and probably shaking it gives you enough shear in different directions. So I've, half or two thirds full sounds about right. The temperature is going to be the most important thing, I think, because obviously the, you want your jam to not be so solid it's not going to move you so warming it up is going to be better and hot in hot water the sugar in the jam will start to dissolve a lot more so when i do this when i'm cleaning at empty jars i definitely use hot water not boiling because you know i am not the sort of physicist that likes burning my fingers um but uh you know i hot water and about half full and shaking up and down to get shear forces i reckon that's the thing so i think the temperature and the the amount of shear you can generate with all that dense water those are going to be the, the important parameters so now uh he can go and do his own controlled experiment based on those parameters and steve if you can send us photos with various. photos with various different uh, obviously the structure the shape of the there's a lot of different variables but different I think types of jam does yeah, it work we'll the same for peanut butter as it does for blueberry jam very important oh. Sugar content. I'm, oh man, this is uh, it, it's it's a minefield. The uh, I, I, when you said you were not the kind of physicist who likes burning their fingers, you, you want to say I'm not a chemist. I suppose is what you're really saying. Is um, now this one worries me. This question it worries me mainly with you, Richard. I think James wants to know what experiments would you like to carry out but cannot, as it would breach ethical guidelines. Most of the most of the experiments I like to carry out. Um, <laughs> Very few within the ethical guidelines. Um, I think, so I, well, the, the one I would go with would be uh, Milgram, I think. So, so if people know the famous Milgram experiment, uh, you sit down and you've got a range of switches, uh, essentially from very low voltage to um, very high uh, voltage. And um, you think there's somebody next door doing a memory test and you're told by the experimenter each time they get something wrong, uh, you should give them an increasingly large shock. And what Milgram was interested in is what number of people would go up to the highest level and essentially um, uh, exterminate the person next door. And he found out that was a fairly high percentage. But there's been a lot of criticism of that because the people argue that the people were kind of role playing. They knew it was an experiment. They knew they'd really not be giving proper electric shocks to somebody next door. Um, and, and so, you know, maybe the results they've got um, aren't very helpful. So I think I'd like to repeat that, but by giving real shocks uh, to somebody up to extraordinarily high level, um, and the public could vote who that person uh, was as well, that would add an extra frisson uh, to it. So I, I think Milgram's classic study, but, but carried out for real. So basically, if you're in Edinburgh and you see there's a pub to by Richard <laughs> Wiseman, don't go. There's, it's going to lead to terrible places. Um, Sophie, what about, about you? About you? Um, someone once said to me, well, what would happen? Because we know that um, like laughter, which I study, is incredibly dependent on your development. So we know this from rat studies, that the more, the more you tickle a baby rat, the more it will laugh as an adult rat when it's tickled. And I'd love to know if that works with humans. And that would require us to not let some people tickle their babies. And that's where you start going, OK, I probably don't want to go down in history as the, the scientist to force people to not tickle their babies. But if I could, that's really what I'd like to know. What is it that when goes on is being tickled? Because, you know, there's a set where people like being tickled, but then 
that bit where of of of, uh, of no no stop 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 but it's a kind of that 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 balance that balance of the loss of we, we like a sense of being able to lose control but then there's a point where we wish to regain do we have any studies on that point of of, of that moment where we want to to regain ourselves the, 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 <laughs> there's something about the way that it is being expected of you and the sensations associated with it so it's very interesting i mean even with babies you can't just march up to any baby and tickle it the baby has to you want can't to that's entirely you. true just <laughs> so anyone watching this this is a this is a <laughs> it's almost a law <laughs> And of course, that continues throughout your entire life. I mean, if I marched up and started tickling my colleagues, uh, you know, even before social distancing, they would probably frown on it. So there's already it's something that's happening in certain kinds of uh, you know permitted interactions, and there are, there are debates about why you know why it happens at all. But it is interesting that it's in, you basically one of the most ticklish parts of the human body is the rib cage, and that's what you want to move when someone laughs. That's what creates laughter. So you're basically touching the thing that you want to start actually producing the noise. It's not a universal rule. The most ticklish place on a rat is the nape of the neck. And of course, feet are also ticklish, but they're also very safe bits of the body. They're not sexual. They're not dangerous in other ways. So there are these kind of permitted safe bits. And then the, once you've sort of set that up as a behavior, very often, I mean, I can make my son laugh uh, by just threatening to tickle him. I don't have to tickle him. And, and you kind of, you're laughing, you know, you've got your laugh. You can stop now. Don't, you don't have to go through with this. So I think there is something, well, it's anytime you look at anything with humans, it gets complex. And as soon as you start looking at laughter, things get very, very complex really quickly. But there's a whole kind of cycle of understanding about like, expectation and, and, and allowing somebody to do this. And also the physical lack of control. There is there is something very odd that happens as soon as you start laughing, whereby you become physically weaker. So there are all these postural reflexes that stop us, even if we're not apparently moving our muscles, but that we are moving our muscles to stay sitting in a chair or standing up so we don't just fall to the ground. And as soon as you start laughing, those get suppressed immediately. And it's why you become weak when you're laughing. It's why if you laugh hard, you will start rolling on the floor. What you're actually describing is an actual lack of control. That's why things like giggle incontinence is a real thing. So there actually is a lack of control that you are, somebody's forcing on you <laughs> with the tickle that you are trying to get them to stop. So the, the, it's, it's a hall of mirrors. Right, thank you. The, um, this question for you, Helen, from Dave. Uh, are ocean vents located sporadically or do they form some sort of pattern like a ring of fire? Uh, ocean, so, so this, the, surf, the first thing to say is that the floor of the deep sea is not all a single place. It is not a completely empty flat plain with nothing on it. It does have quite a lot of structure. The structure tends to be tends to come in one of two types. It's obviously different around the edges because you've got river inflows and you've got uh, sediment coming down, and it's different near the edges of tectonic plates, um, which is where you have uh, magma that's underneath that comes closer up, pushed against seafloor, and that's where you tend to get vents. You get much more tectonic activity in these places. Now, it's not just in those places. There are places where the ocean is um, fractured, uh, and they're actually some of them are out in the deep ocean. So, in the middle of the Pacific Plate, for example, there's this. Um, I think it's called. It's I can't just remember the name for it, but it's a region that's just well away from the edge of a tectonic plate. But it is fractured, and those fractures means that mean that you tend to get hot um, water. So, wa seawater is pumped down under the immediate solid level of the ocean and it comes back up so there absolutely is structure you don't find deep sea vents everywhere you do get large expanses of ocean floor where there's not a lot and then in these places where you get this fracturing and especially near the plate edges that's where you get much more activity um, and you also think find things downstream of there because there are downstream consequences so there is quite a lot of structure down there and you know the, the exciting the, one of the most exciting things about the deep sea is that it is, it is a bit like a treasure trove in that it's not all just laid out. You have to, there's nothing and then there's an oasis of amazingness. Uh, you know, so even the nothing bits are quite interesting, but there's, it's really patchy and you do get these patches of astonishing variety that are driven by plate tectonics. Brilliant. Um, this uh, question, I'll start with you, Rich, on this one. This is from um, Sally. Sally was interested in knowing, um, I hear, um, I hear say people say that you just can't persuade anyone with facts. At this time, with so many conspiracy theories flying around, what are the best ways of trying to lure people into a better way of thinking? That's a very interesting question, isn't it? I think it's understanding why people want to believe some of those theories in the first place. And so, 
you know, it, it, the, the people are destroying the, the 5G masts, you know, just, just a terrible, terrible thing to be doing, um, actively sort of harmful. But I suspect if you talk to them, they think they're doing a good thing. They, they, they obviously think, because they believe those, those ideas, that they're being helpful members of society. So I think part of it would be how you reach those folks. And, and I would probably encourage them, if there's anyone in their families, who, to have a better understanding to of talk science, to those, to talk those, to those, people, those, those people. And always, and do, always what scientists do. do what scientists look do. For look for facts. disconfirming okay. facts. It's okay. And it's true of all of us. Reading the websites or the tweets or whatever it is that confirm our point of view, but go and find the other stuff and then make a more kind of balanced decision. Because at the moment, I think social media, huge echo chamber, you know, we, we just hear our own opinions uh, being uh, reflected back to us. So I think those are, those are, are useful things. And also just to, to realize that we're all kind of capable of, of rational thought and that it's, it's up to us to make individual decisions. And, and that means going out and finding the information and thinking very carefully about it particularly if the thing you're about to do is act, could be actively harmful if you just happen to be wrong. So I, for me, it would be understanding where these things are coming from. Nobody thinks that they're not the brightest person in the world or the best informed or uh, not a nice person. We all think that about ourselves. And so the question is how to challenge that in, in a way that doesn't isolate members of society. You know, call people idiots, anything like that. The worst possible thing you can do. We, we've got to engage. But I would add to that, something which else which I think is really important, which is really important, which is important, which is which is important. Which I'm sure it wasn't really meant like that, is that science is right and everyone else is wrong. And there is one thing that scientists are terrifically bad at, which is listening. And the, there has been a sort of movement which says, oh, well, um, here's my scientific fact and you are all wrong and idiots. And, and there is also a failure there not to listen to the other side, which is sort of what Richard said, but it's not just about you know, it's not even about before you even start finding why, just acknowledging that they have a point of view is a really important first step. Um, and it's it's not just not calling them idiot. That's the first thing. It's get, then saying, just letting them say their thing and understanding that they want to be heard as well. So I, I definitely think there's a danger in this idea of I am right and you all need to be taught how to think like me. And that is the most dangerous thing. And it's one of the things we've seen quite a lot of that, you know, that social media bubble does make worse and we've got we as scientists have a responsibility to say that is not we need to improve ourselves but we also need to say that is not the job of science the job of science is not to be right so that everything else is wrong the job of science is to say we've got a process here um we can look at these things this is our understanding it's not then to point fingers and say but you're an idiot because you don't agree with me and and we have to actually really put the work in to listen to other people because otherwise the divide is just going to get worse and we can see it with this we can see it you know different countries response to the the virus that different leaders respond to the virus for example that we're getting this factionalism i'm right you're an idiot and we that is the single most important thing scientists have to listen and they have to under, have the humility to listen and show that leadership that allows other people to listen um as well as obviously providing robust scientific advice which is based on the best available evidence so there's a bit of nuance here that is so easy to ignore i think and i think we shouldn't ignore it i should get off my soapbox my soapbox now no but i do think there's an issue i think one of the problems sometimes is the extreme aggression which comes with it with some of the conspiracy theorists that are, you know i'm sure everyone here has had a moment where someone on social media well more than one moment has been very aggressive towards you and you start off by trying to just be nice to them and then by about 0.5 you realize especially with that medium if you're trying to have that debate within the social medium uh then you just you can't get anywhere because the refusal mm. to you know i spent a whole weekend not realizing that pete hitchens was pretty stuck in his ways in terms of his climate change attitude and i was being awfully friendly and it turned out to be a <laughs> terrible waste of time but that's the other problem as well isn't it which is again i think that's why that question was about trying to understand the psychological techniques which allow as, as you're saying uh, as well Helen, that way of actually having a conversation that's yeah. right a, a, a conversation is two-way i think helen's absolutely right but it's, right. it's also it's, it's also up to everyone to realize they may be wrong i mean my goodness science has been wrong about loads of stuff in the past and and so it's it, it, it's the best approximate 
the approximation we have based on the evidence, but scientists will often disagree with one another and you can get consensus, but still science is about having that debate. And so it isn't a question of, as Helen says, I'm right, you're wrong. Both of us might be wrong, um, or it might be I'm wrong and you're right and so on. It, it is a, a, a conversation and the one that we need to have, I think, at the moment. Um, so I wanted to know, in the 21st century, how much has it changed in the ability for neuroscience and psychology to work hand in hand? <laughs> uh, hugely. So, um, I mean, neuroscience for you know, which has you know, been around for a long time, but it's, it's a world of stuff very often connected you know, molecular questions with molecular and questions and how, and how particular, bit particular bit cells, particular are cells are working. And psychology is, uh, again, another new science that was asking questions about behaviour. And the thing that, the thing that really changed in the, you know, relatively recently really was in the 1990s, we started getting our hands on these brain imaging techniques that let us study neuroscientific phenomena brain activation in a way that we could relate very easily to behavior now we've been doing this in different ways in trying to so the, uh, a very venerable tradition of neuropsychology working with people who've got brain damage and seeing what can we can infer about the structure of mental representations and processes from what they now have that problems based on their damage but to be able to ask these questions about healthy brains is, is absolutely extraordinary and for me the power comes from having both we have a brain level explanation but we are also always relating it to behavior it has it's to have a link to the psychology so the psychology is absolutely, absolutely crucial, here. crucial and i think that's why and i think that's why it's been, been a very sort of a powerful and technique because it's essentially it's highly essentially it's highly we have the neuroscience we have the neuroscience and we have the psychology and, the psychology. and that's what gives and that's what gives us that extra kind of you know kind of you know um explanatory explanatory power i think richard would you agree on uh that more of a psychologist than interested in, in brains. I'm interested in, in people and, and how they think and behave. And as I guess my main interest is how you can modify that to make them happier or more successful or make societies more giving or whatever it is you want to do. And for me, so it isn't a theoretical question. For me, it's a very practical question. Well, what do we want to do um, uh, to, to, if we're in this rather tricky situation we're in, uh, to keep our spirits high or to become hopeful or whatever? And for me, normally those answers come from psychology. They, they don't come from having a deep understanding of which part of the brain are involved. That's interesting theoretically, but for the most part, you know, I'm, I'm quite practical. And, and so I just want to know, you know, what, how, if you have develop a sense of gratitude or whatever, how does that just impact on, on how you feel? And for me, that level of explanation is, is enough. Brilliant. I'm going to go over to you next, Helen. The, uh, um, I'll just quickly remind everyone that uh, next week, uh, tomorrow morning Mark at 10 a.m., we have Mark, and then from Tuesday onwards, we start in kind of Shambles College where we've got uh, Brian Cox is coming on and A.L. Kennedy and Ian Rankin and Natalie Haynes and various others. That's 10 a.m. every morning. And uh, also remind you about the tip jar that we have where we're collecting uh, a resource for some of the performers who've been hard hit by this and also some of the uh, art centres and other venues as well, making a fund for them. And you can also subscribe to our YouTube channel and Patreon is where, in fact, all the other things that we make, as well as doing these things that we're doing during this period of isolation, we have probably actually thousands of hours now. Yeah, thousands of hours of, of science interviews, musicians, podcasts, loads of different things. So find out about all of those. Um, now, Helen, this is from Paul. And he would like to know, please, can you tell us, I'm going to say this probably wrong. Can you tell us about the siphonophores, particularly the long, stingy, stringy thingy recently found off the coast of Australia? Uh, that is um, for one of those. So I, I don't know about the very specific one that was found off the coast of Australia. I do think that the siphonophore is officially the longest animal. We know that the blue whale is the biggest living animal on Earth, but a siphonophore, uh, one of the many species of it, is the longest. And they are these very odd things. They're, they're colonies. Um, they're kind of gelatinous and they have these long tendrils that hang out because that's they're basically fishing. You know, as water runs past the tendrils, they can collect nutrients that way. And they're sort of made up of they're sort of they are colonies of different organisms. I am not an expert on siphonophore biology. I'd have looked it up if I'd known this question was coming. Um, but they're really interesting and they shock people because they're they're kind of alien. You know, they're they're goopy, gluey. They look like they're not really alive because they're just sort of 
they're almost not there you know the people who don't like cucumber say it's almost not there it's like that but a bit in the Asian world um so yeah so they do wash up on beaches uh and they do some of them sting I think you probably shouldn't go not as badly as jellyfish uh, the worst jellyfish we hear of but uh don't go poking them too hard but you do get these long stringy jelly like things in the ocean and the thing is that in the ocean it makes sense to live that way because water is very dense it can support you don't need all this solid structure that we have in order to hold yourself up you can just be gelatinous and you know be carried you, so it's there's a different load of um priorities for existence uh that that lead you to that point but i don't know the, i don't know about the one on the beach in australia sorry uh, this is uh, uh, from the live feed now. This is from Carl for you, Richard. You, Richard. Um, similar to your problems with pop-up books, is there a trick or illusion that you have never been able to master? <laughs> um, my goodness. Uh, well, there's, there's one I shouldn't be ever allowed to perform again, which uh, is, is, is similar. So, so a slice of hand. I'm not a slice of hand performer. I can do very basic slice of hand. And when I'm with my colleagues and friends who do proper sleight of hand, it's it's so terrifying uh, that uh, I, I I back off. But you never see them with a deck of cards in their hand. So if you want to put vast amounts of, of time into rehearsal, um, then uh, then that's that's the way to go. It's not my sort of thing. Uh, but uh, the uh, the incident with which I'm uh, best known in the magic community in terms of potential disasters uh, was there's a, a trick. Uh, called the French guillotine, which is a six, which which is a six foot guillotine, and you get a member of the audience, and you, get a member of the audience and you put their head, you put their head in the stock, and the guillotine, and blade, the guillotine comes blade comes down. It appears to penetrate through the head and emerge from the bottom of the stocks. And he's probably not giving away too much to say that the uh, spectator is perfectly safe. Um, however, it is a genuine blade that comes down. So I'm performing this at the Edinburgh Festival many years ago when I was about twenty. I'm tired. It's a late night show. I've done it loads of times. Time before. Before. Spectator comes on. Spectator comes on. Head into the stops. That's all great. That's all great. I don't notice. I don't notice. They put their hands. They put their hands over the top. Over the top. And that's the genuine blade. And that's the genuine blade. So I'm just so about. I'm just to about to pull the rope. That's a reason. 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 Oh, I thought, my oh, goodness. goodness, I nearly just took fingers off. Yeah, fingers off. Um, so I was like, um, shaking, so I was like oh, shaking, shaking, not the person back. I have never, have never, never touched that, that trick. Okay, <laughs> thank you. Uh, so, uh, so, uh, so I think that would be the trick. I think that would be my trick. Most of them make most And also, if I weren't going out, it would make everyone quite nervous as well. Um, that's uh, that's great. It's like watching Paul Zenon. I think you were in the same room. Paul Zenon, who does some wonderful stuff, and he, he gets a, a snooker triangle at times and uh, then places a beer uh, in it. And then through centrifugal force, he swings it around. But we were, I think all three of us were playing a very small room. And as he started it, you can always see the fake look. You know, if you've watched it, you know the sense of jeopardy he's creating is sometimes not as great. But that was one where I thought, yeah, I think he really is feeling a sense of jeopardy. That's when his coat looks very expensive. And she's directly below that point. Um, yeah. no, it's a ter terrifying. It's like um, stab, a smash and stab, which is the one where you put the upright right nail behind uh, in a, one of the bags and then you mess around with the bags and then you slam your hand down on the bag and hopefully miss the nail uh, and that trick goes wrong more than any other trick so there's loads of performers with scars on their their palm uh, but i was there one night uh with a palm you know, bang and then the nail just goes straight through their hand and they picked it up and it's just you say you're so used to performers acting and suddenly you realize the reality is just, and they just looked at their hand and just fainted uh on the uh, the ground so yeah it's uh Given that I started off making little rubber dinosaurs disappear, it's a remarkably dangerous profession. Also, it's a way to start a messiah complex as well, isn't it, with that bag of nails? Um, this <laughs> is um, Stuart. Uh, as a question for you, again, from the live feed, Sophie, which is, um, can't someone with mental fortitude resist tickling? So if you can resist, does that mean you were not tickled as a baby? <sighs> well, do you know, I wish I knew. I wish I could give you a good answer to that. We, well, it's Laughter is... For want of a better phrase, an innate behaviour. So deaf and blind babies will laugh if they're tickled by someone that they, they will let tickle them. So you don't have to have heard it or seen it to produce it. But we know from the rat literature, you can increase it. You know, the likelihood of it happening by kind of engaging with it a lot as an infant. 
that being said, as an adult, people tend actually to be very variable in how much they uh, they like tickling, which is often people say, I do not like it. Um, so I think if you you probably could tolerate it, but it would still be, um, well, or, or be able to be resistant to it, but you would have to have some other kind of emotional engagement with what was going on. And I think back to that example of how if someone you didn't like tried to tickle you, you'd be like, no, I'm not laughing and stop it. You know, so if you can kind of engage that kind of level of emotional disconnect, then I think you probably could find yourself not laughing. The thing is with laughter, once it's got you, it's got you, it will start coming out. So if you, I mean, my impression is with performers who have to not laugh when they're on stage, like a lot of actors, they'll, they'll try and get ahead of it before there's any chance for the laughter to get in there. So I think the way to be resistant is to start before there's even any risk of tickling being on the table, that, so you can kind of catch the laughter before it's anywhere near you. Brilliant. I have a question for so. I, I can't remember whether this is a study or whether I'm just making this up, whether I'm just making this up. Somebody at some point told me if you cross sit cross legged and cross your arms, you can tickle your own feet because you've kind of got it wrong about where the feedback is coming from. You certainly so there's <coughs> what study that um, that Richard's referring to is a study showing that you you can't tickle yourself. Your brain knows when it's you touching yourself versus somebody else touching you. And actually your brain's very good at discounting sources of input that come from you. All sorts of senses do this. You can trick it. So if you do that kind of thing, so you just got your hands in the, you know, your fingers in the wrong place and then point to a finger, critically, you mustn't touch that finger and ask people to move it. They'll often move the wrong finger because they're getting the wrong information in. So I can believe that you could fool the body in that way with tickling as well. I wouldn't be at all surprised. I want to know if you've crossed your arms your feet, how do you tickle yourself? What have you, I mean, how many extra arm. arms do you have to have to do that? <laughs> I, you know, if you sit cross-legged and then cross your arms, I think you could cross your arms. I think you could tickle your feet. The, the, the viewers should try it. They should let us know whether it works. I, yep. I can't remember whether that is a study or I, I just read about it somewhere. Citizen uh, there's, science, there's, let's get this going. That's <laughs> a yoga class that went wrong, basically, isn't it? Somewhere. <laughs> So, Steve, jam once you've done your jams, you could move on to the self-tickling as well. And again, keep uploading that as well. Um, this is I don't have a name for this one, actually. But this is a question for you, um, Helen, uh, which was you, you kind of talked about this, I think, in the first week. But it's still interesting, which is uh, this person was wondering how isolation at the moment compares to the isolation of being at sea and that oh. sense of community. Yeah, so it's it's very and very and different. I mean, the obvious differences are that uh, we have internet. Uh, you can still get post, and the floor doesn't move. And those are actually so. I quite like the floor moving, but you know, internet and post are enormous things. And honestly, when all of this first started, all I could think was, this isn't isolation. You can have video chats with people, and get, you have no idea what actual isolation is and of course not everyone has internet accessibility and the hardware to get video feeds so we can't take that for granted however it is much more isolated in those respects at sea the one thing you do have is you have people with you who are the same people so it may not be very many but you do at least have one or two people to talk to on a regular basis um so so it's the things that are similar are having being entirely in charge of your own time. So you need the discipline and ships meal times keeps coming around and you, you, you keep in track via tracking your meals um, because they that's the only the only reason, you know, if you're living, if you're working in 24 hour daylight, the meals are the only reason you know what time of day it is because you, so you keep that rigid schedule because otherwise you will go a bit mad. Um, so. Yeah, so being and being limited in what you can do. Obviously, on the ship, you know, if you look at normal life, you you sleep somewhere, you work somewhere, you eat somewhere, but they're not normally all exactly in the same place. And we're living with that. But actually, you need that a lot less than you think. I am a complete fidget, and I adapted to living on ships very quickly, and I like it in spite of that confinement. It's all about expectation, and if you change your expectation, then your reaction to it changes. So I think that. Um, and keeping a diary for anyone who is struggling with the isolation thing, write down what you did each day, because when the visual surroundings are the same, um, you feel that time's not passing. But if you write down at the end of the day what you did, you, you, have, this, you have this record of your thoughts changing. So, so there are definitely things at sea that help us 
here but really in a lot of cases you're more isolated at sea or in antarctic bases um because you don't have we still don't have internet most ships you you can't get normal email even now on on most research ships um so you know the it's it's more extreme in some ways but you do have a small number of people and when it works well the last thing i can talk about this for hours and i shouldn't the last thing i'll say is that when it works well you have a good ship um and a good task I have been far more content at sea than I have ever, ever been on land. And I really mean that. I felt a really deep contentment on expeditions that I have never had on land. Because it's simple. You only need so many things. You need good people. You need a task to do. You need physical, you know, shelter, food, all that stuff. And if you sort those out, you don't need anything else. And so people see isolation as a bad thing. But actually, if you take away quite a lot of the internet and the fluff and the, you know, nonsense actually some parts of it are much better so so it's a really interesting question to ask i think it's interesting the purpose in isolation that's the important yeah. bit isn't yeah. it if you have, yeah. you because, have because I, I know this is a much shorter period of time but i know helen sharman i'm talking to her and she said the lovely thing was at, at the time she went into space for a lot of the time, there was no way ground control could, could communicate with you. So you would have a period going up where there was no, you could just focus. And Mike Collins, when people say, oh, poor Mike Collins, he didn't go on the moon. He just go, and, and he said, it was a wonderful time. No one was bothered with him. They were all concentrating on Buzz and Neil. And there he is, looking at the earth and going around the moon. So I think, can I ask you, Sophie, uh, do, do you have any other uh, opinions on, uh, uh, Alana has actually asked, she asked about um, uh, the chief saying, are there exercises we can do? Are there ways we can psychologically prepare? Is there anything you've been doing that kind of helps in this situation? Yeah. Yes, definitely. So, um, I mean, you, it is it is difficult and it is weird. But the, so for one thing that you can do, and it's really simple, and it relates exactly to what you're saying about purpose, uh, set yourself a thing to do. Even if it's just like, um, you know, I'll try and draw a blue tit or I'll call my mum. It doesn't matter. It doesn't have to be I will learn to speak Russian. But set yourself a thing to do because setting yourself something to do and then doing it gives your brain a real boost. You get a kick from that. And it's actually a very effective way of feeling that your day has been different. I would say... Um, pay attention to exactly like Helen was saying structure make evenings different from the day make weekends different from the weekdays it's hard but you just have to bring something you know bring stuff in we we do stuff at the weekends that we don't normally do during the week just to try and make it feel different for our son and these are all just tricks that give you some kind of like shape to the day and purpose that even if you are if they're things that you are inventing yourself and the third thing is keep talking to people so exactly like Helen was saying we are a lot there are lots of really good things that you can use now. So video chats like this, they wouldn't really have been possible. If this had been 10 years ago, we would really have been in a hole. But one of the really interesting things about human interaction is, and this is a really lovely study from Robin Dunbar, if you look at the comparison of face-to-face -face conversation, talking on the phone or having an email interaction, you talk for longest, our laugh most and our happiest afterwards a face-to-face -face conversation goes down for a phone conversation goes down most of all the text of course there's a missing value there which is no interaction at all all of it's better than nothing but the really striking thing about the face-to-face -face interaction is it doesn't matter if the person's in the room with you or not it's enough to be able to see and hear you i feel like i've met the three of you today like i've gone up empirically my i'm getting the same bang for my buck i've talked for as long i'll have laughed as much and i'll be happier afterwards than if i'd just spoken to you on the phone so the, so make the time to do that and it doesn't again you don't have to be talking about particle physics you can just have a gossip but get in touch with people and just have a reason for a conversation because that will that's really good for your brain as well and you will feel better afterwards that's brilliant um Rich Question from you. This is one of our, our last questions. This is from Sharon. Um, I think it's for you. Uh, what are your thoughts on particles being points so that an electron can only be up or down if it was attached to a surface? Then its location could have be anywhere on that surface. So, um, so um, it's it's an interesting one, and uh, I've been looking at it for quite a while. And I I think that what you'll find with particles is although they can only be up and down, sometimes they move side to side as well. Uh, within the universe, which is quantumly determined, has uncertainty yet certainty. That's how Brian Cox does it. Brilliant. I've totally believed you. Utterly, utterly. <laughs> uh, I think we'll save Sharon's question. Sharon, we'll ask your question when Brian's on on Thursday. Uh, a lot uh, of people have been asking, though, can we see your terrible pop-up books? So uh, it does feel that we should. Yes, there we go. There um, we actually, go. Although, um, actually, although this is a, a good hint and tip, I mean, everything Sophie and Hans said, 
Fantastic. Also, use your hands. I mean, too much screen time is, is not great. So, you know, if there's any kind of hobbies where you're actually doing something, making something, I would recommend pop-up cards. Uh, but I'd recommend uh, pop-up cards only if you have more artistic ability uh, than I do. So this is, uh, this is, I hope you can see this. I'm trying to learn this up here. This is a pop-up card. Here we go. Look at this. Ready? Brace yourselves. Look at that. <laughs> it's pretty good. That's pretty cool. It's, it's good, isn't it? It's, uh, I'm, I'm struggling a bit with the, the owl uh, oh, there. Right, but, I uh, hadn't realised. Why isn't it, is the other one a pussycat or is it a person? It's not it's the owl not. and the pussycat went to sea. Well, well it's, it's not because I, I didn't actually know about the owl and the pussycat going to sea. So there was an owl in the, uh, the YouTube video. The other one was a pussycat and I thought I'd just replace it with a person. And then every time I open this, uh, people get very confused. But there we go. That's one. And uh, this is the other one here. Now this one's good. Um, as a, <laughs> technically, look at this, right, brace yourselves. Uh, well, am I getting this right the way around? There we go. Right, ready? Look at that. Oh, I think that is very good. That's bad, very good. Is that is yeah. good. Look at that. So how anyway, what's the challenge? How, how long did it take you to make that? Uh, three years for the first one. <laughs> <laughs> um, so no challenge though. Can anyone make a better pop-up? Your, your viewers out there, make a better pop-up. Send, uh, send in a photo. Uh, that's the, the pop-up challenge. There's loads of stuff on, on YouTube about how to make pop-up cards. So there we but go. That's the home. Uh, clean jam jars. It's yogic tickling. And it's the Richard Wiseman owl in a pea blue boat uh, with person in jumper. So it's kind of, yeah, it, 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 the owl and the goth went to sea in a pea blue boat. Um, Edward it was Lim a sea green boat, a beautiful sea green boat, was it? Yeah, but it's no, no yes. pea green. Uh, he's got pea green. He's, right. he's got pea blue, I'm afraid. Um <laughs> thank you very much, everyone. Uh, thank you, for everyone, for watching. Uh, I should say that, of course, um, Helen's book, uh, Storm in a Teacup, is uh, available. And you're working on another one, aren't you, I think? Yes. I? Yeah, yeah, all about how the ocean works. And Richard's most recent book, there are loads of books from uh, Richard uh, Quirkology. Well, it starts with the luck factor, doesn't it? And then it goes on and just so many. And also, if anyone's having insomnia, by the way, I'm trying to remember the title. That was a very useful book, the book that you wrote Night about. School. Night yeah. School. Yeah, yeah, the other, yeah. yeah, the other was put you to sleep, but night school was intending to do that. Yes. Yeah, and it's it was. Uh, I know quite a few people have said something at the moment, and that is a very useful book. And your most recent book was about uh, the psychology of uh, Apollo ground control, wasn't it? Shoot for the moon is uh, how we achieve impossible things based all upon the uh, psychology used to get us to the moon. And so for you, haven't got round to being uh, doing a book yet because you're head of uh, neuroscience. So that's been that's 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 that done, isn't it, for the time being? <laughs> I, I have a podcast. I, me and the poet Will Eves and I have a podcast called The New Romantic. So you can find us on iTunes if you just need to hear more of me. And Will Eves wrote one, one of my, my favourite books. books of last year, Murmur, which is uh, kind of based around the life of Alan Turing, which I highly recommend if you're looking for a very beautiful, very poetic book about the nature of experience and time and many different things. Uh, it's absolutely fantastic. Thanks very much, everyone, for watching. Uh, as I said, there's a tip jar at the bottom. Uh, go subscribe to our YouTube channel. Go to our Patreon so you can see lots of stuff. Do whatever you want, really, but enjoy the rest of your afternoon. Thank you very much to uh, Trent, who, of course, produces all of these shows. Uh, we're back at 10 a.m. tomorrow. Uh, with Mark Gatiss and others, but now we're going to play some music from, and you're going to see it as well. Uh, I mentioned them at the beginning, 1201 Alarm, Steve Thompson's fantastic band. And uh, so enjoy this. We leave you with 1201 Alarm. Good afternoon and goodbye.